Good day. I'd like to welcome you to the Bible study that we do uh, by, uh, I think it's Vimeo, maybe. It's uh, sent to many people via email, and it's also on our church's website. Uh, my name is David Mosser, and our uh, church is Salado United Methodist Church in Salado, Texas. And uh, so I welcome you this morning. We are looking specifically now at Job 38, 4 through 11. And uh, I'd like to uh, read the text to you. And this comes from the Common English Bible, which is used by uh, the United Methodist Publishing House uh, to do its adult Sunday school curriculum. In the olden, olden days, they used King James and RSV. Then in the newer days, they used the New International Version and the New Revised Standard Version. And uh, today, they use the Common English Bible. So I would ask you, if you have a copy of any of those uh, particular translations, they're all very good. It begins at verse 4 in chapter 38 of Job by saying, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you know. Uh, who set its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring tape on it? On what were its footings sunk? Who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang in unison? and all the divine beings shouted. Who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment, the dense clouds its wrap, when I imposed my limit for it, put on a bar and doors, and said, you may come this far, no farther. Here your proud waves stop. That is the text that we have for today, and I'd like to uh, go through it. I want you to notice at the very beginning that, uh, that this is sort of God's response, uh, beginning in chapter 38 here. Um, and uh, the very first verse of chapter 38 says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. So, there's this whirlwind going, and uh, God answers Job. Job has been asking question after question after question after question of God about why has this terrible thing happened to him where he was uh, at the beginning of the book of Job. He is a very wealthy, very prosperous, very happy human being. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Hasatan, the Satan, and uh, Yahweh uh, decide to uh, make a test and see if Job is good for nothing. In other words, is Job good for naught or is Job good because of the rewards that God has given to Job? That is really the question. So, uh, we come to this part where God begins this series of rhetorical questions. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Uh, gird up your loins like a man, I will question you, and you shall declare to me. And then we begin with the uh, series of uh, questions, the rhetorical questions that God asked Job. The first one is, after this very beginning, uh, uh, who is this that darkens counsel, which basically means, who is this that puts me to the test? That's what Yahweh says. And then he says, uh, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? In other words, when I created the world, when I separated light from dark, when I separated the waters from the dry land, when I did all of these things, where were you? That's what he asks. Uh, and then it sounds kind of sarcastic when he says, tell me if you know. Then the second question is, 
Who said it's measurements? And in a sense, it sounds like God is the great architect of creation. Here in this particular uh, sort of poetic part of, of Job, uh, Yahweh is sounding like someone who is putting together a master building project. Who said it's measurements? In other words, uh, measure uh, twice and cut once uh, is, uh, is something that probably Yahweh thought to himself as he was creating the world. And then there's another uh, sarcastic uh, comment, it would seem. Surely you know uh, who said it's measurements. Surely you know uh, who stretched a measuring tape on it. And so this idea that God is carefully calculating everything that God is doing, that Yahweh knows exactly what needs to happen and in what steps and sequence these things need to happen for creation to come out perfectly as it does. Uh, on what were its footings uh, sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? Now this sounds just like Creation is built like, say, for instance, the temple was in Jerusalem. And this may have been something that was in the back of the poet's mind when he was writing these things down for uh, Israel to consider. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we need to remember is a lot of the books of the Old Testament came into their final form, or near their final form, when Israel was in exile. And so the big question for Israel is, who is this God who for centuries has told us we were the chosen people, and the next thing we know, we end up in Babylon or in Susa, and we're in chains, we're prisoners, we're in exile. What kind of God is this that treats his chosen people in this particular fashion. Now there's a lot to unpack there and I'm not going to try to do it. But the point is, Job is trying, the book of Job is trying to tell people that the Deuteronomic theology doesn't always work. That God punishes the evil, God rewards the good. Because the people of Israel see themselves as good as God's chosen people, and yet they end up finding themselves in exile, which would seem like punishment. And so there's this question in their minds and in the minds of others in Israel, who is this God that we worship? What is this God uh, like? Uh, and so we have these images where Yahweh is asking Job all these questions. Uh, while the morning stars sang in unison and all the divine beings shouted, this is what was going on when God was uh, putting in the footings and laying the cornerstone. And then in verse eight, it says, who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and the dense clouds its wrap, when I imposed my limit for it, and put a bar and uh, put on a bar and doors and said, "You may come this far, no farther. Here your proud waves stop." Now there are a couple of things that I want to say about these last few verses. The first is that in most of Hebrew theology, beginning at the very beginning in Genesis, uh, the sea has always been, or the ocean, has always been something of a mystery. It has such great power. It personifies evil and chaos in uh, many cases. And uh, all you need to do to remember this is to uh, think about that... Uh, the damage that was done to the city of New Orleans in, um, I can't remember what year it was, but I, I think it was maybe 2005. Uh, 
New Orleans, unbelievable, C completely devastated by Katrina. And then in uh, 2000, I believe, 17, we had Hurricane Harvey that came ashore right by Houston and then sat right on top of Houston and rained and rained and rained. The flooding was unbelievable. And uh, even people here in Salada tell me the stories of a couple of different floods that happened in uh, the village of Salado uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. And, and so all one needs to do is remember back to these instances that we see either on the news or read about in newspapers or some other kind of media or have experienced such a thing uh, our own selves to know the power of water. Harvey and Katrina uh, caused $127 billion each of uh, damage. They both, dam uh, the damage assessment was uh, virtually equal, $127 billion. That is how strong they are. So that's one thing to remember, that what God is saying is that Yahweh is circumscribing the power, the destructive power of the sea. And not only that, but God sets the bar, which means like a sandbar, and putting doors on it to say that the sea can come this far, but no farther. So that is talking about the power of God's word is able to uh, make sure the uh, power of the sea or the water or the chaos uh, can only do so much damage. And uh, the other thing that I want to say, besides that, uh, that water in uh, the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, has a lot to do with power and chaos, uh, it, it's interesting to me that when uh, this Jobin text is given to us, it sounds a lot like the birth of a child. Uh, uh, when the waters burst forth from the womb, and of course we know that um, water of a womb is significant. In fact, it's in our baptismal liturgy in uh, the prayer that talks about Jesus being born from the water of the womb. And so water is important, um, not only in terms of power, but also in uh, this idea of creative uh, regeneration, that uh, through the water, new generations of, of uh, persons are, are born. And so after that, uh, God says that he made the clouds its garment, the dense clouds its wrap. In other words, it sounds like wrapping in swaddling clothes, only the clothes in this case are not, uh, you know, cloth like Jesus uh, would have been wrapped by his mother Mary, but uh, more like the clouds are the wrap for that. Um, and then God sets a limit. God creates and then God limits. Uh, you may come this far, no farther. Hear your proud waves stop. And so what we understand is that, that God uh, treats uh, the sea as a child that is born. Um, and uh, there are some parallels between Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, and the birth of uh, Jesus as the Messiah. So in a way... Uh, not only uh, the water separated from land, you may come this far, no farther. That's a separation of, of water and the land. But it is also a way to say that Jesus being born as the Messiah is like a new creation. When Jesus is born, the world is recreated in the image of God and with the blessing of the Messiah. I'd like to thank you for uh, being with us today, and uh, I encourage you to read the book of Job. Every time you read it, you will find something new in it that is very worthy of your time and effort. So thank you.